Perhaps you've heard that um, re the resurrection is ground zero of the Christian faith. That's true. Down through the centuries, the church has stood firmly on the miraculous bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. For the skeptics, this seems uh, like an insignificant issue that they can explain away in a number of ways. But on the contrary, the resurrection is the bedrock of our faith. It is what gives us hope beyond death, and without hope we cannot survive. Philip Yancey is the one who said, hope flows like lava beneath the crust of daily life. It's possible that some of you, your well of hope has run low the last few months. Maybe you've lost someone who meant a lot to you. Maybe there's a strained relationship that doesn't seem like it's going to get better. Maybe you are still grieving the loss of a dream that you've had over the last number of years. The good news is because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, because he lives, we also live. He is the first of those to be resurrected, and we will follow, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. That is hope. That is hope. For the skeptic, life is misery. You die and you are no more. For the Christian... Life is misery, <laughs> okay? We die, and we are finally at home with the Lord Jesus. Let me pray. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to just open your word and to take a look at what the truth of what you declare to be reality. As we look at it, Lord, may we be convinced. May we not just be convinced, but may we believe, trust the truth, the evidence, and then live lives of meaning and purpose because you are alive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When uh, you think of Easter, when most humans think of Easter, what is it you normally think of? I think most people will think of bunnies and candy, and of course there's candy in the back. If any of you are missing candy, you know, have some. Please don't leave it for me. Um, egg hunts. Probably at least there is some thinking and planning around a family dinner with kids running around. But if most people think seriously at all about Easter, my guess is they think of tragedy. They think of a good man who was a religious leader who was murdered. I don't think many think of it as victory. Of course, the skeptic simply laughs at us Christians for believing such nonsense, accuse us of having blind faith, in something that is not verifiable. And the place that they begin is not Sunday morning in Jerusalem in a graveyard. They actually start at the foot of the cross. They arrogantly announce, maybe you've heard this before, that he didn't really die, that he simply swooned. That there on that day, they just, all those people just thought he was dead and he was taken down, he was wrapped up and laid in a tomb, and there he revived. He got out of the wrappings, he pushed a two-ton stone away, and he slipped past the guards. That's actually what happened. Now, you talk about blind faith. 
Um, it seems to me that it takes more faith to believe that than to simply believe he was raised from the dead. But to believe what the skeptics would claim doesn't take anything supernatural. To believe that he was raised from the dead does. But let's, let's go there. Let's ask ourselves, was he really dead? Because before you can build a case for the resurrection, I think you, you must establish the fact that he was actually a corpse, not just in a coma. So if you check the record of, of the eyewitnesses, you'll read in all four gospel accounts, even though they are, the details that they will share is a little different, you will read and hear all four of the witness, witnesses say that he died. Matthew says, uh, chapter uh, 27, verse, 30, verse 50, that he yielded up his spirit. Mark says in chapter 15, verse 37, that Jesus breathed his last. Luke uses those exact, exact same words as Mark in chapter 23, verse 46. And John in 1930 says he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Add to that all of the eyewitness account information that is shared with us in the Acts of the Apostles, we would hear it over and over again that he had died. And the Apostles carried that message, as did the early church fathers in the, gener in the centuries that followed, that he had died, and the earliest, earliest witnesses state that the death was certain. But if that isn't enough, maybe we need some evidence. So I'd ask you to take your Bible, turn to Mark chapter 15, the second gospel in the New Testament, and we'll consider it a little bit more in detail. Now, Mark was, wasn't an eyewitness, but he wrote down what the apostle Peter told him. And so these are actually Peter's recollections concerning his death. We'll start in verse 39 of Mark 15. And we have what is said to be the testimony of a centurion, a warrior with battlefield experience. So this man knows death. He's caused it. He has dealt with it on numerous, of, numerous occasions, and he has risen to the rank of centurion. So now he oversees the crucifixion detail a quadrangle of four soldiers with the victim walking in the middle, dragging or carrying a portion of the cross all the way to the place where it would be fixed to a vertical beam. Verse 39, we read the centurion's testimony. When the centurion who stood facing him, so let's imagine this scene, the centurion in his Roman garb is standing facing the cross, his eyes are knee level and he's looking up at the one dying. When the centurion stood facing him, he saw that in this way he, Jesus, had breathed his last. He said, truly this man was the Son of God. Now it's debatable what he meant by that. Being a Roman, he could have uttered he is a son of the gods or the son of God. The point is, the verb was. And that suggests it was over. He saw the limp body of Jesus and this crucifix, the centurion testified spontaneously that he was dead. There's a few of us here that were there when our fathers passed away. I was there in the hospital room when, uh, 18 years ago when my dad breathed his last. And you can tell. There is, no debate, there is no doubt when they were alive and when they died. Uh, it, is, it is as clear, Ryan, I know we were there, Renee, we were there when your father passed. You can tell. And this centurion could tell. And, and, and this centurion has no personal interest in the victim. He simply looks, makes a studied evaluation, and determines that death has arrived. Jesus is gone. Hold your place here in Mark. Go over to John chapter 19, 
we read of the physical proof, not just the evaluation of a qualified witness, but a bystander even, but actually the physical proof. John 19. <coughs> Excuse me. Verse 32. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was, had been crucified with Jesus. Now, now, why in the world would they do that? To be cruel? <laughs> no. No. Uh, actually, that was a merciful act because it hastened, hastened the death. You see, death by crucifixion did not come because of cardiac arrest or loss of blood, even though that could happen and probably did on numerous occasions. Crucifixion, death came by asphyxiation. The victim would literally move up and down on the cross to exhale, and they would have to pull themselves on the nails through the wrists and the nail through the feet and push themselves up to exhale and then fall down again. And so if you broke the legs, there wouldn't be the ability to pull oneself up to to breathe, and so they would asphyxiate. Verse 32, So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they did not break his legs. They'd never pass one up who was still alive. They'd break the legs to get it over with. But with Jesus, he was already dead. Verse 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear to inflict pain? No, no, he's already dead. He, he pierces between the ribs into the heart to verify the death. And at once there came out blood and water. John is not a physician. Dr. Luke was. Um, the words blood and water are correct from his perspective. But it really wasn't water. It was serum. Merrill Tenney, in his book, The Reality of the Resurrection, writes this, The separation of the dark red corpuscles from the thin whitish serum of the blood, which John refers to as water, indicated that death had already taken place. When the heart stops pumping like water and oil, the red corpuscles and the white serum separate. And so when John saw blood and water, quote-unquote, flowing out of the piercing It confirmed the death. And if you check with the doctor, if you don't believe me, check with the doctor, they'll verify that that is what what is actually happening. Turn back to 15. I I wish, Mark 15, I wish it was all in one section. It's not, so you're going to be turning back and forth this morning. Um, So I thank you for working with me on this. Mark uh, chapter 15, verse 42. When the evening came, since it was the day of preparation... The day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, went to Pilate asking for the body of Jesus. What does it mean, a respected member of the council? At that time in Jewish um, governance, there was a body of 70 men called the Sanhedrin. Basically, that means 70. This man was part of that group, and yet it says he was a secret believer in Jesus. We'll read that in a moment from John's Gospel. But he is surrounded by those who want Jesus out of the way, but after his death, Joseph of Arimathea comes out of the closet, so to speak, and he goes to Pilate, the one who was interested in what was actually happening with Jesus, and as a member of the council, he asked for the body of Jesus, using the Sabbath as a reason to quickly go take possession of his body and get it ready for burial before sundown. Pilate only cares that law and order is maintained in his town during Passover. The last thing that Pilate wants is 
some squabble between the factions of the Jews some religious, over some religious leader. And so when Joseph goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus so he can give him a proper burial, obviously Pilate, his preference is to have Jesus in the ground as soon as possible. Verse 44, Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died. Summoning the centurion, he asked him whether Jesus was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. Crucifixion usually took longer. Sometimes it lasted days. In one case on record, it lasted nine days. Nine days. And Jesus had died in three hours. And so Pilate had to make sure that he had actually died. And so he asked the man in charge of the crucifixion to confirm it. And that brings up an interesting point. Not only have we heard the testimony of the centurion that he's dead, not only have we seen the blood in the serum, proving that death had occurred. Now we hear the testimony again from the centurion before Pilate. Yes, sir, he in fact he is dead. And now Pilate gives the body of Jesus to Joseph of Arimathea, which he never would have done if there was any doubt about his death. But there's something more. Turn back to John 19. And again, thank you for turning back and forth. Verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. That probably shouldn't bother me, but it always does. How can you be a secret follower of Jesus? If you're a follower of Jesus, is that something you hide? Now, don't be... I, I, I don't want us to be stupid about it, okay? Um... We don't need to be offensive. We don't need to stand on a street corner and hold a sign saying, you're all going to hell. You know, that's, that's just, I want to check for brainwaves on people that do that. I just, it just seems so stupid to me. But to hide the fact that you're a follower of Jesus? You, you see, for those of you who are Christians here, The Lord planted you in a sphere of influence. (laughs) Your family, extended family, your community, your neighborhood, your job. The Lord planted you there so you would make him known to those who haven't trusted him as their savior. That's your job. Paul calls us ambassadors for Christ. All of us as Christians, ministers of reconciliation. Who knows how many of the Sanhedrin might have been influenced by Joseph if he were not a secret service Christian. He asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus and Pilate gave him permission. That's what we read in Mark who earlier had come to Jesus by night, he came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. Nicodemus brings the ingredients to embalm the Lord Jesus. Next verse. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen, cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. You take myrrh and aloes, you mix it together, it becomes like molasses, a a gummy, sticky substance so the linen would stick to the body, and as they wrapped it together, it would form like a cocoon. 
wrapping the body uh, from the neck down, and they would wrap the head separately with that same sticky substance and then tie it under the chin to keep the mouth closed. Those of you who have been around those who have passed, you know that the jaw flops open. And so if you go to a funeral where the body is present and you walk past the casket and the mouth is closed, it's because it's wired closed. Sorry if you didn't know that, but that's what they do. I'm giving you all this information because it's going to play a huge role in the resurrection. But the main point here is Joseph and Nicodemus would never have wrapped the body of Jesus if there had been any sign of life. I mean, they're touching the body. They're lifting it. They're even <laughs> probably breaking up a little bit of the rigor mortis that had already set in. The body is cold. It is absolutely lifeless. The centurion said so. The blood and the serum say so. Pilate agreed with the release of the body, and Joseph and Nicodemus verify that it's dead. Verse 41, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which one had never been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. They had until 6 o'clock to get it all done. He died at 3. They have till 6. By the way, that's why the women come on Sunday to finish what the men left undone because time was of the essence. They were under a time crunch. So what we have here on crucifixion evening before 6 is a dead body and a loss of hope. Now, we look back at this event with 2020 hindsight. And they, we expect them to simply believe what Jesus had said to them over and over and over again, that I'm going to die, I'm going to come back. I mean, it's what he said. But from their vantage point, he's dead. He is a cold corpse. And, and, and to guard against any foul play, they roll a, at least a one-ton, probably more like a two-ton stone in front of the opening of the cave to keep the wild dogs and grave robbers out. And the Jewish leaders ask for a Roman seal to be put on the grave and the quadrangle of temple guards placed there 24-7 as well so no one would come and get his body. He's dead. Buried and they all expected him to stay that way. Let's fast forward for a moment. Um, look at Matthew chapter 28. Let me show you a plan that is absolutely stupid. There are some things in the Bible that are absolutely stupid, okay? <laughs> if you didn't know that. And I'm not being sacrilegious. Matthew 28, there's been a resurrection. We'll go back to that in a second. But there's an absent body, and the Jewish guards are responsible, and they're in panic mode. And, and they go back to the Jewish officials. I mean, they're certainly not going to go back to Pilate. <laughs> okay. And they tell them the body's gone. 28, chapter 28, verse 11. While they were going, behold, some of the guards went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers. 
Um, wh why? Why? Why would they do that? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they they have to lie about what happened. They're getting bought off. And they said, "Tell the people the disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep." And if this comes to the governor's ears, Pilate, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. You think political spin is just a 21st century concept? Originated by our media? No, not at all. It's as old as time. But, but think about it. How dumb is this? We were asleep. Okay, the penalty for being asleep on duty is death. Okay, but, but, but the Jewish leaders are going to take care of that. But if you were asleep, how do you know as his disciples? I, that's the dumbest plan I've ever read. Unfortunately, 21st century gullibility, we would buy this, unfortunately. Now, but, but think about this. There's only two groups of people that would have taken the body. If, if the body was stolen, right? And he didn't resurrect. Let's, let's go there. If there are two people, two groups, the friends of Jesus, or secondly, the enemies of Jesus. Now, if it was the friends of Jesus, the question have, has to be asked, how could they? There's a stone and a seal. There's a 24-7 guard. Furthermore, all his followers, his friends, thought he was dead. Why would they drag a corpse out of the tomb? <laughs> to look at it? His friends wouldn't have done that. And, and, and what, if it, what, what about the enemies of Jesus? Why would they? Belief in the resurrection was what they were trying to prevent. They wouldn't want the body gone. And if they had taken the body and once his followers were claiming that he'd raised from the dead, all they'd have to do is produce the body. He wasn't raised. Take a look. Here he is. Here's the body. They didn't have the body. Arnold Toynbee once said, if they, if they ever find the body of that dead Jew, Christianity crumbles. But they'll never find the body. It'll never show up in Jerusalem because it was raised alive. But you see, they have an agenda, agenda to protect, and they don't care about truth. And the global public would rather believe a lie than think through how stupid the lie really is. So what really, really happened? They place the body in the tomb. The stone seals it. Life goes on in the hours that follow. But inside the tomb, in the darkness, a miracle is transpiring. The glorious life of our Savior ultimately revealed with his presence after the resurrection is now entering that body. When a body is raised from the dead, resurrected, not just resuscitated like Lazarus was. Remember the story of Lazarus? Lazarus dies. He's in the tomb for four days. Jesus comes. Mary and Martha accuse him. Of, of not caring about Lazarus because he waited too long, and, and Jesus re resuscitates Lazarus. Lazarus died again, okay? What a bummer that is. You die once, you come back, and you got to do it again? Ugh. Jesus was the first to be resurrected. I make that distinction because when you're resurrected, there isn't a problem with matter or space, 
or time. Resurrected bodies can move, can move from one place to another in a split second. It can move from earth to the third heaven in the twinkling of an eye. He has a resurrected body. So removing himself from the wrappings doesn't mean he has to unwrap them. He just takes the headcloth off and sets it aside. The only reason the stone is removed by the angels is to let us in, not let him out. He didn't need the stone to be moved. He didn't need doors unlocked to come visit his disciples after he'd been raised. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, John chapter 20, finally, we'll go there. We'll stay in John the rest of the time. Appreciate Brady reading the first portion of that for us this morning. What we have here is John's account of what they saw when they got to the open tomb. The stone's been rolled away. The angels have announced he's not here, he's risen. And so having heard the report from the women, Peter and John take off on a foot race. And, and look, I, I get a kick out of how John records this. Um, so Peter went out with the other disciple, that, and that's John, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. And if you are faster than somebody else, you can't help but making sure everybody else knows that you're faster. You didn't find that funny? I thought that's because I'm not fast. But the other disciple outran Peter, of course you're going to mention that, and reached the tomb first, and stooping in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Now think about what he saw. If someone's going to steal the body, would they take time to unwrap it? No. They're going to grab it and run, right? The phrase he saw in verse 5 is the word, the original word, blepo. B-L-E-P-O. And it's the word for just basic observation. Like you see a red light. You see it, plain as day, right? Then Simon Peter came following him. Remember, I outran Peter, in case you don't remember. And he went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes. Ah, different word. This is the word theoreo, T-H-E-O-R-E-O. And it has in mind uh, the idea of theorize. Peter goes in, he, see, he sees what John observed, and he's intrigued. He begins to analyze what he sees. What is it that he saw? He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, important term, folded up in a place by itself. What he saw was a cocoon, similar to a butterfly's. So here's the face cloth. It looks like a head, but nothing in it. One man wrote this. The grave clothes laid like the shriveled, cracked shell of a cocoon left behind when the moth has emerged and hoisted her bright sails in the sunlight. Or a glove from which a hand has been removed. They saw the linens used by Joseph and Nicodemus, but there's no body. And they see the face cloth by itself in another part of the tomb. Merrill Tenney adds, The word used to describe the head cloth does not give the idea of a flat and folded square, but a ball of cloth bearing the appearance of being rolled around an object that is no longer there. Remember in elementary school, we used to blow up balloons and then take paper mache. Remember that? Strips of newspaper. Newspaper is something that was actually 
printed and delivered to your doorstep back in the day, okay? Those of you who don't know what a newspaper is. We would carry strips and we'd put paste on it. You remember paste? Wow. I used to eat paste. Maybe that, I, well, I won't go there. Anyway, we would make, we take the paper mache, put it around the balloon, let it dry, and then we'd pop the balloon, and yet the paper mache would remain. That's what we have here. Verse 8, then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in. Whoa, I'm way ahead of myself. He went in, he saw, he believed. As you probably can guess by now, this is a different word as well for saw. It's the word Edo, E-I-D-O, and it means to understand. Not simply an observation, not simply theorizing what it might mean, but seeing and understanding. And the best part is that what John saw resulted in belief. He believed. That's what happens when you see it. That's why you can have a family member or a friend sit through a church service like this and be bored to tears. And all they're thinking about is lunch. Or is it going to stop raining so we can have the Easter egg hunt? That's all they're thinking about. You are sitting on the edge of your seat, mesmerized by the truth. You're discovering nuggets of truth, and you're amazed, and you want more. Be patient. They don't see it yet. It just hasn't clicked. But I tell you, when the bottom drops out of their lives and they don't have any answers, all of a sudden the fog clears and they see it. The next 40 days, Jesus appears and ministers to his followers. It hit me the other day as I was reading the accounts After his resurrection, he never spent time with anybody who didn't believe. Isn't that interesting? The only two recorded in Scripture that didn't believe and he appeared to them after the resurrection is his half-brother James and the Apostle Paul. Who was a Jewish Pharisee himself who Jesus appeared to on the road to Damascus because God had planned to use him to bring the gospel to the Gentile world. But isn't that interesting? I would have gone to Pilate. I would have walked into the meeting of the Sanhedrin. No, 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 no. You know, Jesus doesn't do that. I wonder why he didn't go to the temple and let everybody know, I'm back. You know why he didn't? Because that's our job. That's our job. When we see and we understand and we believe, we become his ambassadors. We knock on the door of the Sanhedrin. We go to Pilate, empowered by the Spirit of God who came to take Jesus' place. We are to be his witnesses to our world, just like his followers were witnesses to their world. The purpose of Scripture 
The entirety of the Bible points to this point in history. Everything God did in the Old Testament up to this point is pointing toward the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And everything written after this is pointing us back to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Salvation in two words, if you want to describe it, is substitutionary atonement. Jesus died in your place to pay your debt. Not to Satan, but to God's holiness. And when he died in your place and you have accepted that truth, you've believed it, you've abandoned yourself to him, two things happen. (laughs) All your sin, past, present, and future, is placed on him. And all his goodness and righteousness and purity is given to you. So now God sees you, as we learned on Friday night, as flawless. The cross has made you flawless. And the resurrection is God's amen to Christ's statement, Testelestai. It is finished. No more need for any other religious activity. Simply believe, and it's done. He takes your sin, you get his righteousness. If you haven't seen that, and you haven't believed that, today's the day. Simply saying to him, Hallelujah, what a Savior, thank you. Don't get confused by the verbiage. Trust him that it was enough. Lord, thank you for our time together in the word. If there's one person here, two people, handful, who have trusted you as their Lord and Savior, make them miserable until they do. And for us, Lord, who have trusted you as Savior, may we be your hands and feet of love to everyone around us. To show your grace and mercy, in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.